Well, I think we can see we owe a great debt to the Answer Coalition for, for, reminding us, for reminding us of something that we might not otherwise have remembered. What have you seen lately about the horror of our war against Iraq and its people? Heard a stirring set of speeches that the nation should hear as we hope to change our course. The um, Nancy Coalition, I, I think virtually all the members that I know, over 35, went to Iraq with us. Back from 1991, we, we went to Iraq. And he went up through 2003, the spring of 2003, before shopping off March 19th. We never hear, or, or probably never think, that um, our government committed the most serious crimes known to law against the people of Iraq. Genocide, the war of aggression, the war crimes, crimes against humanity, all of them. And they began cruelly more than what, 12 years actually, before shock and awe, George Bush's uh, celebration of U.S military power. In a way, they began with the corruption of the United Nations in August of 1990, when sanctions were imposed upon the nation of Iraq by the nations of the world. Most of them are totally unaware of it, with the insistence of the United States. And the sanctions were incredibly deadly. America should never forget that moment on the CBS program in 1996 when our Secretary of State, uh, Madeleine Albright, was being interviewed by Leslie Stahl. And Leslie Stahl was reading from a report by the, food, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, which had identified 575,000 children under the age of five that died as a direct result of the sanctions. And Stahl read that part of the report to Madeline Albright and asked, is the price worth it? Strange formulation and strange question. And Madeline Albright looked right at the camera. She said, it's a very difficult question, but yes, we believe the price is worth it. Where's the soul of the spirit to be find anything worth the lives of 575,000 children? And if you walk through the Turkey Wars, a few poor parts of towns, of Iraq, which is most of the parts of most of the towns in the 90s, you see the children die. The children are dying. We put out a book called The Children Are Dying. They were dying from the sanctions. They weren't the only ones. The second largest group is obviously the second most vulnerable group. That's elderly. <coughs> People with chronic illnesses required some kind of treatment they couldn't get because of the sanctions. It was um, mass murder or genocide by sanctions. Certainly 575,000 children. Genocide, if anything is. And that wasn't enough. Just the way that uh, our president celebrated, that you remember him flying the plane toward the U.S. aircraft carrier off the coast of California, here not very far from where we're sitting today, landing to say that the war is over or something like that. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished, right. 
big flag. That type of mentality is uh, genocide and has to be addressed. The war itself was a bloody, bloody assault. The nation essentially defenseless people. Even the original Gulf War, the so called UN War, was all the US except a bunch of embarks. Egyptians who were being our man in Egypt at that time before the happy uprising there. So we saw our country destroying what history often calls the cradle of civilization and boasting about it. And ignorant of what it was doing, or even the consequences. I watched them building this huge new embassy, 17 acres, in the heart of Baghdad. Had they forgotten their history? We built an embassy in the heart of Tehran while the Shah was there. And if you remember what happened. When the people found freedom after the Shah was driven out, <coughs> and our embassy and its members were taken hostage and held for until after President Carter was defeated in the election and Ronald Reagan was installed as president. What we've done to Iraq is immeasurable in terms of its inhumanity. Watching them struggle with food rationing and during the sanctions. Incredible uh, how they could, the integrity with which they could get food to the poorest families with very little food, but they didn't have enough food. They had medicines, but not enough medicines. We went through and asked coalition people at that time, went through the hospitals every year. It's hard to get through a maternity war without. The, the, the Iraqi family is a very close family, and their customs are different than ours. When the member of their family goes to the hospital, the rest of the family hanging out there too. If it's a child, the mother and father are there. If it's a baby, the mother and father are sitting on the bed or laying on the bed or sleeping on the bed. And to get through a maternity war, it might take you 15 minutes just to look at the shriveled babies and the dwarfed generation that was being threatened without hearing a sudden wailing. We're, we're an inhibited people compared to, to so many of the um, Arab and Asian peoples. And they're saying they let you know about it, you know. And they wail. And it's loud and clear. And you knew the baby had died. If you doubt it, you can go back and, and see. And we brought down our heavy firepower on the people. And we turned them against each other in ways they hadn't been. And now we've left them with a, a brutal dictator. There's no other way to describe the man that's in charge there now. See as if history will repeat itself unless uh, some miracle intercedes. Our death and the people of Iraq have not had a moment of peace and no one free from fear since from want since 1991 is immeasurable. And yet, overwhelmingly, the American people think that you know, those crazy Iraqi are mean spirited people. <laughs> and, uh, ought to be taught a lesson. So hopefully we'll find it in our hearts and um, will to stop doing what we did to Iraq.
to other countries. And the country on the front line right now is Iran. And Iran's a lot bigger than Iraq. And Iran's had experience with us before. For 25 years, the people of Iran have suffered under the Shah. And restored the throne, as we kind of put it, in 1953. And who deprived the people of that country of their heritage and their will and their right to determine their own destiny for 25 years. We had more tanks than the British Army. Three U.S. major weapon systems were authorized by the Congress only because Iran agreed to appropriate funds to buy some of the new material themselves. They had sideliner missiles, an air-to-air -air combat missile, but no other country in the world, not the United Kingdom, no NATO country, just the United States, and Iran had them. And they were our number one outpost, it's a big outpost. It's on the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union. We'd spy from Mount Dimmeron, which is about 45, 50 miles northwest of northeast, I'm sorry, of Tehran, on the Soviet missile testing range. We forget that Iran is the way we could get to Moscow during World War II. We could go over the pole in those days, we could go through Europe, and you'd have to go through Iran to get there. Probably right just up the Caspian Sea, a few hundred miles, and the inland is less than 100 miles from there. And we're after Iran. Enormous pressure. And if we go for it, uh, the cost will be enormous. I saw the Iranian people do something that I never thought I would see. They've only seen something similar once since then, and that was in the Philippines. And that is force a very powerful despot to leave by nonviolent action. Again, about 1976, the people started taking to the streets. They couldn't stand the oppression anymore. And they started with thousands, and then tens of thousands. They first marched with them in 76, and 77, and in 78, they had millions on the streets every weekend. And they closed down everything. They closed down the schools, they closed down the bazaars, they closed down the factories, they closed down a lot of the government agencies. And they had an atomic energy commission that was huge, the Shah. In those days, it was perfectly fine for, for uh, Iran to work in, in nuclear energy and nuclear weaponry potentially. And we helped finance and the schooling for them. They had, they had people who graduated with PhDs from the major universities around the world studied postgraduate at Los Alamos and then Vienna with the UN Commission there. And they were leading lights in nuclear potential for weapons and for energy. The Shah had this dream of replacing oil when it was gone so that people in, in Iran would have a perpetual light through nuclear energy. But they were crazy with anger that they had no right to even voice their opinion as to how their lives would be lived and no choice would be made for their nation. And last year, 78, he killed as many as he did. One day in August in Dolly Square in downtown Tehran, he made helicopters fabricated that is assembled in Esfahan in Iran. Esfahan in 1500 was one of the ten largest cities in the world with 500,000 people. In 1960, it was still about 500,000. And that's when the Shah had his dream of making Iran the, great, the fifth great industrial nation. By 1975, Esfahan was, which had, was a beautiful ancient city. It had a million and a half. And about half a million of those were living in poverty, off the land. They couldn't have import food for the first time in their lives. And uh, they were unemployed and living in 
road shanties right over the outskirts of town. But they stopped the country. He killed about 47,000 the last year, and then he just got up and left. And the country was returned to the people and to his destiny since then. And now it's threatened by assault by the United States. And we have to do all within our power to see that that doesn't happen. It will make Iraq a minor tragedy in comparison simply because of the difference in population and the potential consequences of nuclearism with China and India looming on the horizon. The U.S. being the world domination is coming to an end, not because we the people had the courage or the will or the strength to stand up and stop it, but because uh, bigger countries, a lot bigger countries, with a lot of energy and a lot of imagination are overtaking us, and we can't take them on. If we can't handle Iraq, how can we possibly handle a China or an India or a country like that? And our people can see that now, but we want to make as much progress as we can, and Iran's in the scopes, and it has to be prevented. The, um, what we have to do is reduce our military spending gradually. That's the weather rate. 90% ought to be a goal. We'll be a lot safer. And God knows the rest of the world will be a lot safer if we do. And we have to focus quickly on nuclear weapons. We signed, in fact, we signed, I was Attorney General, we signed the Nuclear Non Proliferation Treaty. It was a treaty in which Countries that had nuclear weapons, there were five or six at the time, agreed in return for the non nuclear powers, signed the treaty by which they agreed never to develop nuclear weapons, that the nuclear powers would eliminate their nuclear weapons so we'd have a nuclear weapon free planet. Instead, there's been proliferation. We have nuclear weapons now that we're unaware of. I was involved in an expert witnessing case in uh, Tacoma, Washington last fall. The uh, Pacific Trident II nuclear fleet is based in uh, Puget Sound. And so the Federal District Court in Tacoma had jurisdiction over this case. And there are 30 Trident II nuclear submarines in that Pacific fleet. Eight are at sea on alert at all times. <coughs> Each of those subs carries between 140 and 144, I don't know why the difference, nuclear warheads and missiles. One is 20 times the size power of the bomb that incinerated. Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the Bell Deep. And the larger one is 60 times. The larger one, they say, will leave a crater 50 miles in diameter. Take a point in the Los Angeles area where you have the largest population within a radius of 25 miles. <coughs> and how many million people would you kill in the direct blast? Whatever the firestorms that surround the direct blast might be. And imagine 140 of those from one ship. Most of us have a hard time counting the 40 cities in China or in Europe, even the United States, you know, cities. Take them all out, kill all those people. Can sanity permit such a thing? I mean, how is it that we've let it go that far? 
And there's the Atlantic Fleet, too. I can't tell you the facts about it because we don't have a case against it at this time, but uh, it's got to be similar, doesn't it? Maybe not as big because we're focusing more on the Pacific now, but with China. But we have to come to grips with that. And we're a long way from doing so. And the future of what happens is in the hands of the people. This America is, well, it was said, it's only you and me. The question is whether we have the vision and the courage and the compassion to stand up and stop this madness, and it is madness, before it's too late.